My watch collection has expanded and contracted over the years. I recently let go of one of my favorite pieces, but I acquired a long time grail. And I'll show you that at the end of the video. My last watch collection video was almost two years ago, so I figured it was about time to give you an update. So in this video, I'll show you the current lineup and I'll talk a little bit about each piece. I thought it would be fun to go in chronological order, so I'm gonna start with the watch that I've had for the longest time. All right, before we get into it, quick thank you to today's video sponsor, PDF Element. PDF Element makes working with PDFs simple, easy, and quick. For example, maybe you need to add a line of text or a signature or an image to a PDF file. Maybe you want to combine or separate multiple pages, or maybe you need to convert a PDF to or from a Word doc, Excel sheet, or PowerPoint slide. PDF Element makes all those tasks super easy, along with a bunch of other advanced features like batch processing, PDF search, and more. It can work across all of your devices, and for a limited time, you can get 50% off PDF Element Pro by using the link down below in the description. First up, we have this little rectangular Citizen Quartz dress watch. I actually don't know the reference number for this watch. I haven't been able to find the exact model online. I'm sure it's discontinued because this is from the 80s. It's just a cheap quartz watch, and I'm sure it's not worth anything today. My dad gave me this watch when I got my first job after college, and, you know, it wasn't some special, like, grandpa gives you his Rolex moment or anything like that. It was just a practical thing. He's like, hey, you're working now, you're dressing up a little more, here's a watch. He actually worked for a long time at IBM, and back then, if you worked at IBM, you wore a white shirt, a black suit, he had some burgundy brogues, and a tie every day, and he would wear this watch. So this watch does remind me of my dad's corporate grind during the 80s. I don't wear it much anymore. It doesn't seem to hold a charge, like I'll put a new battery in and it just dies within a few months. But of course, I hold on to this watch for sentimental value and I wear it every now and then if I dress up. I do love the ultra thin dial and the rectangular smaller size case. It's sort of like a poor man's Cartier tank. All right, next up we have this Seiko SKX-013. This is my first dive watch. It's my first automatic watch. Back when I got it, back in 2016, it cost $215 on Amazon. And at the time it was the most money I'd ever spent on a watch. I wore it on its stock Jubilee bracelet for a long time. And then I eventually upgraded to this Oyster bracelet from Strapcode. It's made for this watch, so it fits it perfectly. And as much as I love the kind of jangly, comfy Jubilee bracelet, I think the chunkier, heavier Oyster bracelet makes a lot of sense for a dive watch. I also like wearing this watch on a black Perlon strap. It's very comfy. And this is like my vacation watch. Even after I got, you know, quote unquote, nicer watches, I would always bring this on vacation, especially if I was going somewhere like where I was gonna be swimming in the ocean. I don't know, there's something about this watch. It's, it's tough, it can handle water submersion, and it's not that precious. So if something did happen to it, I wouldn't be devastated. I also wore this watch on my honeymoon, so it reminds me of that time, so it does have some nice memories attached to it. This one doesn't get a ton of wrist time anymore, but one thing I've realized is that my desire to wear a certain watch waxes and wanes over time, and so, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if a few months from now or a few years from now, I fall back in love with this watch and wear it nonstop for a few months. All right, next up, we have this little Casio F84W. It's a slightly less popular model of the F91W that you see everywhere. And apparently this one was made for the Japanese domestic market, so it's more popular in Japan, which obviously makes it super cool. This is a tiny watch. It's eight and a half millimeters thick. And by today's standards, it's just very small. It's got this lightweight rubber strap and it honestly feels more like wearing a bracelet. I'm not sure why I got this watch, although it has gotten plenty of wrist time. I mean, I think that from a practical standpoint, a battery powered digital watch makes a lot of sense. It's very low maintenance, very easy to read compared to an analog dial. You know, it never has to be wound. And at less than $20, I've really beat this thing up. I don't care if something happens to it. I've taken it swimming and taken it on vacation. And it's just been a nice little everyday beater watch. I'll probably gift this one to one of my little nieces or nephews one day just to see if I can get them to get bitten by the watch bug. And speaking of the watch bug, apparently that little F84W didn't scratch whatever itch I was feeling at the time because shortly thereafter, I bought this Hamilton khaki mechanical. Just like the SKX at the time, this was the most money I'd ever spent on a watch. You know, it had a Swiss movement, it was a Hamilton, it was mechanical, and I was really excited about it. And honestly, it totally lived up to my expectations. I've probably worn this watch more than anything else in my collection. It's not perfect, you know, the lug to lug distance is way too long, in my opinion, for a 38 millimeter watch, but 
Really everything else about this watch is great. You know, it's mechanical, but not automatic. So you have to wind it up by hand. And I kind of like that daily ritual of winding it up. It's very thin and with a 38 millimeter dial, it fits nicely on my somewhat smaller wrist. The dial is simple, readable. I love the date complication. It's a very practical thing to have on a watch. And the subtly domed sapphire crystal makes this watch feel premium. I definitely have a thing for black dial field watches, as you'll see but this one doesn't get as much wrist time anymore because it's been replaced by something a little nicer that you'll see pretty soon. My next watch purchase was kind of a big one for me. It's this vintage Datejust 16030, and it was probably produced in 1984 or 85, which makes it about the same age as me. I feel like my watch journey has been pretty typical. I got into it through cheap fashion watches, and then I was enlightened by all of the YouTube videos and watch forums, and I got a Timex, and then I started getting automatic Seikos, bought my first Swiss watch with a Hamilton, and then inevitably, of course, I started lusting after a Rolex. I bought this watch from my friend Christian over at Theo and Harris. I once heard Christian say that your first luxury watch purchase will almost certainly be a mistake, and I agree. You know, considering my style and my preferences today, I don't think I would buy this day just again. In fact, to be honest, I don't think I'd even go vintage, but I don't regret this purchase and I still love this watch. In fact, I love it more now than I did when I bought it. And even though I've talked about the sentimental component of buying watches or watch collecting, I mean, when I bought this watch, I made a video about it and I you know, went on and on about the sentimental reasons for buying it. And honestly, I think I was trying to justify the purchase to myself. Like I didn't really believe what I was saying. I never understood it until kind of recently, like maybe the past couple of years. Like, yes, you should buy watches that you love looking at and that kind of gel with your style. But just like with fragrance, when you wear a watch, it starts to collect memories and it doesn't matter what it looks like or how much it costs or anything else, your watch becomes attached to these experiences that you have. It sounds super cheesy, but in a way you collect these watches, but they're also collecting you. So while I wouldn't buy this exact watch again, it's not my aesthetic ideal. It will always remind me of the end of 2017 and the beginning of 2018, which was just a really cool time in my life. My self-employment was becoming lucrative. I got to toast my older brother and his wife as the best man at their wedding, and I got married. And thanks to Christian for rush delivering this watch to me, I actually got to wear this watch in my wedding. So is it my favorite looking watch? Definitely not. But if I could only keep one from this collection, it would 100% be this one. All right, moving on to more recent acquisitions that have no sentimental value. We have this SNK 809 from Seiko. Actually got this watch just to do a video review. So if you haven't seen that, go check it out. But I think it's a great watch. It's the watch that I recommend for most people who want their first automatic watch and they can't spend like more than $100 or $150. It's especially great for guys with smaller wrists because it's just 37 and a half millimeters, I think. And it's just, you know, it's like a lot of Seikos. It just offers a lot of value for the price. So I definitely won't keep this watch. I will probably gift it to somebody one day, but I have enjoyed wearing it, especially on a rubber strap. It's very comfortable. And if you want more details about it, you can go check out my full video review. Okay, after the SNK, I got another watch uh, to do a review on, which I haven't published yet, but I'm working on it. And it's this Orient Bambino 36 millimeter. So the Bambino is so adored by watch enthusiasts. It's almost a meme at this point. And while I appreciate Orient, I like the Bambino. I like the aesthetic of it. I think it's too big. You know, it's a dress watch and at 40 millimeters, that size just doesn't make sense for a dress watch. But luckily there is this version, which is technically the ladies Bambino. And at 36 millimeters, I think it's a much better size and proportion for a dressy watch. You know, it's still an Orient. It's still an automatic. It's still got the see-through case back. It's still made in Japan from in-house components. It's still a, an insane value for the price. And it's got all the same charm that everybody loves about the regular Bambino, just in a smaller package. So I will do a full review for this watch, but I think if you have smaller wrists or if you just like a more classically sized dress watch, this one is a great choice. Okay, and finally, we have my latest acquisition, Rolex Explorer 1 reference 114270. This Explorer is the 36 millimeter version. It was produced from 
2001 to 2010, and then it was replaced by the larger 39 millimeter version. This specific one is from either 2006 or 2007, so it's old, but it's definitely not vintage. It's still a modern Rolex. And you know, compared to the vintage Rolexes that I've worn, like this Datejust, it definitely feels more modern. It just feels more sturdy and newer and the solid end links just give it a heft. It's also, you know, it has the Oyster bracelet instead of the Jubilee, but you know, the loom is still bright. So I actually really enjoy wearing a more modern Rolex compared to a vintage one, but it's an awesome watch. And one that I kind of always knew was in my future. I just didn't think I'd have it for another few years. I figured it would be a nice purchase to celebrate some financial or personal milestone, like maybe four or five years from now. And honestly, I was okay waiting for it. I think the anticipation is half the fun. I love researching and finding that exact model number and production year that you want, but an opportunity presented itself early and I'm very thankful for that. I got the chance to partner with eBay to help promote their authenticity guarantee program and you know, I was making a sponsored video with them and I thought that that was basically the universe telling me that it was time for the Explorer. I feel like if you could bundle up my personality and my personal style preferences and manifest it in a watch, you would get the 36 millimeter Explorer one. It's just so clean and minimal and functional. It's high quality, it's luxury even, but it's not flashy. Most people aren't gonna look twice at this watch and I love that about it. Actually, I think that the Datejust with it's engine turned bezel, or if you get one with a fluted bezel and a Jubilee bracelet, and then the Explorer with its smooth bezel and its oyster bracelet, it's like a perfect two watch collection. You know, one's a little bit flashy and dressy, you can wear it with business casual or a suit, and the other one's understated, sporty, kind of minimal and casual. They're both 36 millimeters and they're both the perfect size for my wrist. So all that to say, I think my collection is feeling pretty good right now. It's feeling pretty complete. I honestly don't really know what's next. The only thing I do know is change is constant. And so I know that in a year, five years, 15 years, my preferences will be different than they are now. So I won't be surprised if I find myself falling out of love with this watch or maybe in love with another watch or another brand that I've never even considered. I can't imagine that right now because it basically hasn't left my wrist since I got it. Either way, for now, I am more than content with these watches and I hope you enjoyed this collection. If you have any questions for me about any of my watches or watches in general, let me know down in the comment section. Thank you as always for watching and until next time, stay stylish.